Brad, thank you so much for joining us. You had a lengthy blog post out calling this attack a moment of reckoning. And you say that the, the level of recklessness here is not just espionage as usual. Why is this so alarming to you? Well, I think it's alarming in the first instance because it's so sophisticated and its reach is so broad and it is reckless. It's reckless because it put at risk the technology supply chain, frankly, for the global economy because malware was injected into software from a network management company that then was installed in 18,000 organizations around the world. In effect, it unlocked the door, so to speak, so that a foreign government could then attempt to enter. And what we have identified is that it did, in fact, enter into more than 40 organizations around the world, a number that clearly will rise because this investigation is still in early days. And that included agencies across the United States government. It included think tanks and tech firms. It included institutions in eight countries. And while it did not penetrate Microsoft products or services, we've seen no indication that they were made vulnerable or used as a source of attack. We do have more than 500 security engineers this week working with these customers around the world to identify these threats and help restore their security. Now, what makes it so scary is folks who were updating their software, doing what they were thought they were supposed to do to keep their networks up to date and safe. Those were the folks who were compromised. You say that the attack is still ongoing. What exactly is still happening out there right now? Well, what is happening right now is that people are working to identify all of the organizations where this software may have been installed, this malware may have been injected. And that takes time, both because there are so many organizations globally and because this actor was so sophisticated is so sophisticated. So it takes time for security engineers and threat intelligence analysts to sift through the network logs and all of the other sources of information they need to inspect to determine whether there are continuing attacks within a specific organization. It's the kind of thing that typically in something like this, you know, will take some weeks. Maybe it'll spill into some months. Uh, it re will require that many people after a very long year, now spend their holidays working with our customers around the world. Now, in your statement, you say that you found SolarWinds binaries in Microsoft networks. Does that mean that Microsoft downloaded the impacted software that had this backdoor or giant hole in it, or that hackers actually entered your system through that backdoor? Uh, it's the first. It means that in a few instances, we identified the, uh, the malware uh, in uh, SolarWind software uh, on our computers, but we were able to do additional work, and we're still investigating, to be clear. Uh, but we found no indications that the attackers were able to go from that point to create vulnerabilities in our products or services. You know, as you would expect, you know, we have so many security precautions, in fact, to prevent an attacker from jumping from one place to another. Um, we probably have more security in place than almost any organization, public or private, on the planet. Um, but we still are investigating very carefully ourselves to satisfy ourselves that we, too, have no additional vulnerabilities. So of those 18,000 customers, I mean, what are the chances? How many? What proportion of those customers? You say to be prepared for more victims. but. What, do you, what proportion of those, of those customers do you think could have been compromised here, where the hackers actually got in that back door that had been downloaded? Well, right now, we've identified more than 40. Um, you know, we're going to see that go up. I'll be surprised if this is something in the thousands. It's more likely uh, you know, to, to, to be between you know, several dozen and, and, and several hundred. You know, th what these attackers clearly are interested in, it would appear, is the intelligence that they can extract from the United States government, from other governments that are American allies, uh, from think tanks that are working on issues that are of interest to them, and of security firms. And I think from that perspective, they perhaps are interested in what the security firms know about them, how they're trying to protect people's networks so they can use that information in the future. 
it's the kind of attack that has a lot of potential ripple effects, and we should keep that in mind. Uh, ultimately, it affects all of us, whether we work in one of these institutions or not, because we all depend on the security, say, of the United States government. You know, so it's something that we all need to take seriously, regardless of whether we're directly impacted or not. Federal officials, folks at CISA, are saying that this same hacking group is using other vectors. Based on what you're seeing, other ways besides solar winds, have you identified yet any other potential vectors out there? Well, I think it's far too early in this investigation to conclude one way or the other about the, uh, the applicability of additional vectors. It's certainly something that we're actively assessing. Others in government are as well. I think, in my mind, that really points, Emily, to one of the most important lessons we should take away from this. Uh, and one of the points that I made is we should all go back and read the report of the 9-11 Commission. 9-11 occurred in part, in, almost in principle part, as that commission concluded, because there wasn't this broad sharing of intelligence data. And we've done many things in the last 20 years from, to learn from that. We increased our ability to protect against traditional terrorist threats. CISA itself, I think, created a model for the protection of our elections that worked very well, sharing data with the private sector. But we have to now apply that and take it to heart to cybersecurity protection more broadly. We need better sharing of data across the federal government, more sharing of data between the government and the tech sector. We need to collaborate more closely. And that is the only way that we're going to start to take many other steps that we need to take to strengthen the nation's defenses. So are you saying the United States or the world uh, were at risk of another 9-11 at this point or the 9-11 of hacks? We live with that risk every day. And the sooner we look that in the face with clear eyes and take the kinds of steps that we need to better protect the country and the world, the better served we will be. I think we're going to need to invest more resources, especially on the civilian side of the United States government. I think we need to put in place new processes and give particular parts of the government more authority than they have today. Um, we need to take what we've learned from the past and create a culture of information sharing so that we not only are sharing information as we do with the government, but that we get more information back from various parts of the government, all obviously with appropriate safeguards for national security and people's privacy. But only if we take this to heart and put these measures in place can we have the basis to be optimistic that we're going to do a better job. Now, Russia has simply denied this. President Trump hasn't really said anything. And I'm curious, how much do you believe this particular administration has made the U.S. more vulnerable in cyberspace than prior administrations, given our relationship with Russia? Well, I think there are certain steps that this administration has taken that have made us stronger, including more uh, coordinated public attribution, and I would say especially the work that CISA did around the election. But we need to do a lot more, um, not just in information sharing, but by strengthening our laws. And I think we need to recognize that this is not a world of technology where any government can successfully defend itself by acting alone. We need to look to a better and more coordinated multilateral response. And this is, I think, a priority of the incoming Biden administration. That is good news, because just as you know, we won war, World War II with allies coming together, we triumphed during the Cold War, if we are going to protect the nation and our allies from these kinds of cyber threats, we have to do more to work together. So what would you like to see? from President-elect Biden and the Biden administration? I think we'd like to see several things. Number one, let's focus on how intelligence is shared across the government and with the private sector. Number two, let's look at where we need to put more resources in place in particular parts of the government, especially on the civil side of the government, so that there is greater capability. Number three, let's ensure that these parts of the government 
have the authority they need under the law to aggregate data across the government with leadership in a centralized place. We do get very effective leadership on the national security side today from, say, the NSA. And I think they've done a real service to the world this week with the kind of information that they have shared. But we need more of that kind of expertise on the civil side as well. Number four, let's look at our laws and how we can strengthen them. And then finally, we need a strong, broad, really comprehensive foreign policy so that the administration will have the right tools to appropriately respond and hold others accountable when these attacks take place. That's a broad agenda, but it's a critical agenda, and I think it needs to be to really pursued with a sense of urgency. What is your understanding of what the current administration is doing? Has, has the Trump administration reached out to Microsoft at all or, or vice versa? Well, we've reached out to multiple parts of the federal government because as we see agencies that have been attacked and compromised, we notify them. We've certainly been in closer contact with key parts of the government, most especially CISA and the NSA, where there are really capable, dedicated people hard at work. Um, we clearly need to do more as a nation, as a government, in a more coordinated and comprehensive way. I think we should recognize this isn't a problem that's going to be solved in days or weeks. This is going to be high on the list, I think, for President Biden on January 20th when he is inaugurated.